After back-to-back -back short tracks, we head to the biggest and baddest track in all of NASCAR. How's it going everybody? Welcome once again. I'm Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. So after the big bombshell of information we got dumped on us last week with Dale Earnhardt Jr. retiring and all that fun stuff, Richmond's race weekend went off, you know, fairly uneventfully. Talking about Sunday's race itself, it was a race that was uh, dominated early by Matt Kenseth and Brad Keselowski. Later in the race, we saw other drivers step up, most notably guys like Joey Logano, Kyle Busch started to make noise late. Ultimately, it was Joey Logano, who in a way kind of felt like he came out of nowhere, to win his first race of the season. And while it was Joey Logano's first win of the season, it is Penske's third, so they have currently won a third of the races that we've run this season. And they finished 1-2 on Sunday, so right now the Penske Blue Ovals are looking very good, to say the least. In fact, right now, and this might even have been the case before this weekend, right now, Penske looks like the most complete team overall in all of racing. And now I know they only have two cars, and some of these other teams got like four and stuff, but, you know, if I'm just going to look at whole, whole teams, I mean, both of those cars are looking like two of the top five cars every week right now. And we know Keselowski has championship material, and Joey Logano's been pretty close in years past, so, uh, you know, this, they wouldn't be too surprising if they made up half the spots at Homestead at the end of the season. I know it's early. But y'all are always asking me for my predictions way in advance, so that's that's about as good as one I can give you. It wouldn't, that's, it wouldn't be too surprising to see them make it that far. I mean, last season, I think, what, we saw two Gibbs cars in the Final Four? Like, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw two Penske cars. Wouldn't be impossible. So aside from Penske really solidifying their hold as the number one team in NASCAR right now, uh, there's a few other minor storylines that we should probably talk about. One big thing I talked about last week, and I know it was kind of the, a pretty high topic of conversation throughout most of the weekend, was could Joe Gibbs Racing put back-to-back -back weekends in a row where they performed well? And I've mentioned it many times on the show, it's been said many times across all of NASCAR media, that Joe Gibbs Racing has historically been very good at the short tracks in recent years, and it's no surprise they've been kind of slow starting this season, but the short tracks, Martinsville, Bristol, and now this weekend at Richmond, they seem to perform better. And Richmond was a very promising day for them. Matt Kenseth led the most laps in the race. Denny Hamlin ended up finishing third. Kyle Busch ended up 16th, but he was running second before those final pit stops when he got called for kind of a kind of a rough little uh, pit road commitment violation there. Talk a little bit more about that rule in a second. And Daniel Suarez, who struggled heavily early, much like he's done much this season, managed to rally late and finish 12th, so still got a decent day out of it. And I said Matt Kenseth led the most laps. He also won the first stage of the day, but he was uh, put in the wall on a late restart. He finished 23rd. Dang it, Matt. Just... Even when it's going good, can't catch a break. And the fact that Daniel Suarez had such a good finish here at Richmond, although it wasn't the most flashy of days, the fact that Eric Jones unfortunately cut a tire and was out of the race on lap six, and Ty Dillon also, I think, had was involved in a wreck. He finished outside the top 30. It was a good day for Suarez looking at Rookie of the Year points battles. Now, another big event that I think people like to consistently blow slightly out of proportion was uh, another late race Incident involving two teammates, Jimmy Johnson and Dale Earnhardt Jr. Anything that involves Jr., really anything that involves Jr. or Jimmy Johnson, is going to get some media attention. Late in the race, I don't know what happened. Jr. was kind of sliding backwards. Jimmy Johnson went low. Jr. went way high. And coming off the corner, I don't know, Jimmy just forgot he was outside of him. I don't know what happened. He, uh, they, anyway, he slammed him in the wall. They both had pretty heavy contact. I don't know where Jr. finished. I think Jimmy finished 11th. Ooh, and yeah, Dale Jr. finished 30th, so... Definitely got the short end of the stick on that one. And you know, as incidents go, it's clearly an accident. There's no reason Jimmy would have had to put John Jr. in the wall. It was obviously just an accident. Jimmy said afterwards he just didn't know he was outside of him, but when you look at the replay, it's like, I'm not sure how he just didn't see him. Like, he doesn't, like, I don't know how much blame his spotter really has. It felt like Johnson should have probably just been able to see that Jr. was outside of him. He was pretty pretty much there the whole time. So anyway, that was kind of an unfortunate incident for those two teams, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. I, I don't know. At least in Jimmy Johnson's case, he's coming off back-to-back -back wins before this Richmond race, so he's solidly locked in the chase. That's probably why Junior fans are the most frustrated, because it definitely hurts him. Dale Earnhardt Jr., as a result, currently sits in 24th in points, pretty far out of the chase grid by, at this point. And again, it's still early in the season. We're not even halfway through the regular season yet. Like, what are we, like, even a, we're like a third of the way, barely. And we're going to Talladega this weekend, which Dale Jr. has always been muy bueno at. So no reason to freak out yet, but it definitely adds some stress to an already somewhat stressful situation. So as far as actual driver's days went, that's really the main things I was hoping to hit on in, from this Richmond race. The other thing I wanted to talk about I mentioned just a second ago was the massive amount of pit road commitment line violations. For those of you who didn't watch the race or don't know how Richmond is configured, Richmond's a short track, and instead of having a cone there that along the apron that kind of dictates where you need to enter pit road at, like most tracks have, 
Richmond only has a little orange square, like, in, like, p painted onto the racing track surface. And the new rule, apparently, this year is that when you were going to pit road, in order to commit to pit road, you had to have all four of your tires completely underneath that orange box. I think in years past, like, you only had to have two or something like that, or you could at least hit the box. It was a kind of, it was a more lenient rule in that sense. But apparently this year was a bit different, and it really hurt several big-name drivers, especially some late in the race. Like I mentioned, Kyle Busch. Uh, I think uh, Clint Boyer had a problem with it at some point. I think Matt Kenseth as well. There's a few others. And while looking at the replays, it looked like, yeah, most all of those were actual commitment line violations by the current rule. It just caused me to kind of wonder, especially with the way they enter pit road under caution, everyone was always really close to breaking that rule. It just made me wonder, why did they bother changing it in the first place? And especially since there's not a cone there, and in, like, these cars are all so low to the ground, and the fact that this little box is painted on the ground, it's very hard to see. I can imagine it'd be very hard, at least. I can imagine it'd be hard to see whether or not you had all tires down, especially if you're pitting under green, where it's, you're trying to get as much speed as you can, you're pulling off the racetrack late, you're trying to gauge it and look at your your mile per hour speed, you're looking at a bunch of things at once trying to gauge everything, it's not surprising that your right rear might ever so slightly clip it. And we saw like on that late race caution when several drivers came, when the leaders came to pit road, we saw Joey Logano kind of intentionally cut down kind of late, possibly to mess up second place running Kyle Busch's line of sight so he could not see that box as well, and that was one of the late race penalties that really kind of didn't seem right to me. He, his tires barely clipped the box and it just, it didn't really seem to have any effect on anything. It was kind of a, it just seemed like a dumb rule that kind of artificially created the results of this weekend. I'm all about like NASCAR has rules. They told the drivers this was the rule. They all knew that was the rule going in. But in this case, it was just, it was a dumb rule. And now I probably wouldn't be complaining about it if it hadn't had as much of an impact on the finish of the race or the race itself as it did. But since it did, it seemed to have a pretty significant impact for a few drivers specifically. Uh, you gotta talk about it and just kinda gotta ask, why 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 did you why'd you even bother doing that? I hope I think they should probably change it back for the, the race here in September. That's just my opinion. Don't know what NASCAR say, but I don't know what their actually reasoning for it was for changing it this year. I don't understand why they did that, but they did apparently. Uh, but um, and, you know I bet the drivers will want them to change it back. I don't know. Hey guys, sorry, quick aside. So in case y'all don't know, I usually film Out of the Groove episodes on Wednesday, usually late in the afternoon, and I edit Wednesday night and Thursday morning and upload it Thursday afternoon. Y'all, yeah, that's usually the the, the, the general structure. But I'm currently filming this quick aside Thursday morning because NASCAR, for whatever reason, decided to wait until Thursday to announce a penalty from this last weekend's race. And now NASCAR typically announces penalties Tuesday or Wednesday. That's why I film Wednesday afternoon because usually by then most of the big information has all been released. And unfortunately, this news was a little bit too big and significant for me to just completely cut out of the episode. So here's a quick moment to talk about that. Joey Logano's race-winning number 22 car was found to have a rear suspension violation of some sort. And that has resulted in a pretty heavy penalty. While Joey Logano will go down in history books as the winner of this last weekend's Toyota Owners 400, that win will not count towards automatic admission into the chase or five bonus points. In addition to that, there is a $50,000 penalty and a two-race suspension for crew chief Todd Gordon. And now this kind of contradicts sort of what I was talking about at the beginning of this episode where uh, I was talking about how Penske Racing has been probably the strongest team all year and they seem to be on the best roll of anybody. Let's just say having a $50,000 two-race suspension penalty that costs you the points associated with your victory yeah, that puts a damper on things. And to be fair, penalties like this aren't entirely new for Penske Racing. Paul Wolf is currently in the middle of having to serve a suspension for multiple races. He missed a race earlier this year, came back, and now he's missed after they appealed. Now he's missing this race weekend at Talladega. And I don't know if he has any more races to miss after that, but I know he's I know he's had to miss at least two now. Todd Gordon now for Joey Logano is going to have to miss two races. And uh, yeah, it just makes you a question. And I saw something recently, I think it was more from last season, but I know it is a thing, and I think it actually is still a rule in effect this year, where drivers will often swerve, like, back and forth after after a race, like on the cool-down lap, they'll jerk their cars back and forth, oftentimes to try and make sure their rear rear stuff in the car, car possibly suspension-related things, are well aligned to fit the laser inspections and all that other stuff. Because last season we saw a lot of cars face usually not too heavy penalties for rear end, um, you know, misfunctions or penalties in that sense. And I remember seeing something recently where the two Penske drivers were specifically called out. I th like I said, I think this was mainly from last season, but it's probably carried over to this season a little bit, where the Penske drivers specifically were called out for being the ones that seemed to be most viciously trying to uh, keep their cars, um, you know, 
in the good. So in my opinion, NASCAR needs to seriously lock down and figure out what Penske is doing. And I'm glad that this penalty, Penske's not even appealing this penalty. Like most times when a penalty this severe comes out, the teams are immediately appealing it. Penske's not even appealing this. Like they know they screwed up. And I think honestly that right there should be a major red flag for NASCAR. And they should honestly keep Penske under a very close eye. You know, for years when Jimmy Johnson was dominating the sport, he would they would fail inspections here and there. And NASCAR was always keeping the close eye on them because they were really fast. And like I said at the beginning of this show, I guess when I filmed it yesterday, uh, Penske right now is probably the best consist overall consistent team in racing. And now that they've had multiple penalties this season and multiple suspensions already, and they're not even appealing this one, uh, I think that should raise eyes that NASCAR needs to keep a close eye on this, these two teams. Be interesting to see where it goes from there. Anyway, let's go back to the wrap-up of the actual show that I filmed yesterday. So, uh, thank you for letting future slash still past Eric jump in here. Come on, NASCAR. Announce this stuff on Wednesday. So I don't have to do this. Anyway, moving on to talk about Talladega this weekend. As I said at the top of the show, it is the biggest, I don't think it's technically the fastest, but it's the most intimidating racetrack probably on the circuit to a lot of drivers. It is a daunting racetrack that we've seen some great racing and some horrifying crashes at in the past. We've also seen very lousy racing there in the past. I'm optimistic for the racing this weekend, mainly because Daytona, I thought the racing there this year was some of the best plate racing I've seen in four or five years. And Talladega is different. Talladega is wider, so they typically are able to run three wide more comfortably there. I still hope that, uh, I, I'm still confident at least, that we'll continue to see as much passing, as much, you know, close quarters contact here and there as we did at Daytona, keeping it interesting uh, while ultimately not making it undrivable. A lot of people like to talk about coming to this, the Talladega or the Daytona race weekends, dark horse drivers, because we all know plate races. We've seen like David Reagan win there in recent years and underfunded teams. You know, we've seen a lot of underdogs break through and get wins here. So it's always fun to speculate who of the kind of underdog, below the radar drivers and teams, who do we think's got the best opportunity to snag a win? Which probably isn't too exciting. I'm picking Brad Keselowski to win the race. He's obviously not an underdog. That was, he's, you know, probably most people, a lot of people's favorites to win this race. But it seems like Penske is fast in general right now. And Keselowski's been good at Talladega in the past. So I'm putting the two, I'm picking the two car. As far as underdogs go, though, there's a few to pick from. I'd keep my eye out on both Roush drivers this weekend, Stenhouse and Trevor Bain. They've both been running a little bit better, it seems like, in recent weeks. And I'd Roush Fenway a few years ago was one of the best at plate tracks for a couple of years stretch there. They were dominant. And uh, I think it's just, you know, Trevor Bain won the Daytona 500, so he knows, we know he can get around plate tracks to some extent. I think it's a good idea to keep your eye on those two. And of course, you guys can hate me all you want for saying it, but I'd also say to keep your eye on Danica Patrick this weekend. She's run well at plate tracks in the past. We know that Stuart Haas Racing is capable of making fast race cars. She was on the pole at Daytona a few years ago. Uh... Just saying, keep an eye out on her. But if you want to know my actual underdog pick for this weekend, and it's a pretty big underdog, not only because he's kind of a smaller underfunded team, but because he's also a rookie. I think Ty Dillon might be very interesting to watch this weekend. I think all the rookies, especially uh, Jones and Suarez, will be interesting to watch, especially after they had such a rough Daytona 500 earlier this year. It'll be interesting to see how they bounce back and if we can actually see how well they're able to run in a pack, because we really didn't get to see too much of that <laughs> back in February. Anyway, yeah, that's basically, there you have it. There's not a whole lot of predictions we can make for a kind of a wild card race weekend like Talladega is, so uh, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Should be a good race. I'll be curious to see if the, like I said, the what I thought was really competitive plate racing at Daytona carries over to Talladega. I mean, the tracks are very similar, but they have a couple key differences. Uh, I'll be curious to see how that works out. Should be a good race weekend. Thank you guys for watching. As always, you can follow me on Twitter. You can contribute to the show on Patreon. Keep that thing rolling. You can become a sponsor of the show and get your names featured right here with these people there. You can check out how you could possibly do that down in the Patreon link below. Uh, what else is there? Got my Snapchat down there. I got a bunch of other random crap. Who cares? Also, as I've mentioned, Dex Season 8 is starting this month. It is May now, so it will be coming out very soon. Uh, I expect updates with the sign update and all that type of stuff, all the information you're gonna need. Expect that within the next few days. Uh, and uh, that will be, I'll, you know, I'll upload a video separately that says when everything's gonna be and then a couple weeks from now it's gonna be when the actual signups are. But be ready for that. But yep, that is what I have for this week's show. Thank you guys for watching Out of the Groove. Share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with your teachers, your dogs, your cats, your boss, whoever your crossing guard by the elementary school in your neighborhood. You know, whoever you can find, just shove a cell phone in their face and show them my face. And if they're not hooked, I don't know what will hook them. But yeah, anyway, all jokes aside, thank you guys for watching. Thanks for the support. I'll see you all next Thursday.
Goodbye. I just realized I have like my towel here. I could just go, Whoa! Whoa! and I like disappeared. That would be that'd be a good joke if I could just go, Whoa! and then. Okay, get up out of the frame. No, that's not going to work because my shirt was on. Oh, goodness, that would never work. Oh, this is embarrassing. Cut, cut, shut it down.